Medicaid, enormous percentage of the budget, and uh, the, the fastest growing segment of the budget, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. Can we just, for those in the audience who don't study this stuff every day like you do, uh, explain just sort of Medicaid 101 briefly, if you will, please, sir. Well, I, and I think perhaps most of you are, are familiar with it, but just to kind of level set, you know, kind of our understanding of this program that came about in the mid-60s along with the, the Medicare program. It's an entitlement program, as it's termed, you know, so if you're going to participate in it, then you have to participate in it by, you know, allowing people who are eligible to be part of the program. Interesting thing about it is that we don't have to be part of the Medicaid program. Uh, it is a it is a program that the state can say yes I will or no I won't be part of it. Um, but as you know, we kind of looked at this a few years ago, and uh, and to not be part of the Medicaid system would have enormous human and economic consequences. And so we kind of laid to rest the idea that that Texas could actually go it alone in terms of meeting the needs of Texans out there uh, by walking away from from the Medicaid program. But it is a, it is a, a state and federal matching program, uh, and that, that match is based on a formula, not particularly a fair formula, but it's a formula that's been in place for a long time. Uh, it is primarily driven by the comparison of the per capita income in the state versus other states. So as you can imagine, Texas is doing pretty well these days, has in general done pretty well, and therefore our match actually goes down to some degree. For every percent change in match that we have, that's about two hundred fifty million dollars, uh, either to plus or minus to the to the state's budget, uh, depending on whether that that number goes up or down in the uh, in the particular formula determination. And so those monies then are are brought down, drawn down, is the way we like to refer to it, you know. And this program, uh, which is uh, as Bill mentioned, is one of the fastest growing programs because we have so many people that are getting into it, as well as some of the costs associated with it, uh, is continuing to grow substantially. And um, right now, our match is for every 40 cents we put up, we get about 60 cents back. It's a little higher in the chip program. For every 30 cents we put up, we get 70 cents back. And as you're probably aware, the, the proposed Medicaid expansion has, uh, and even what is uh, supposed to be even a, a more generous, uh, quote unquote generous, giving our money back uh, to the state, you know, in order to uh, subscribe an expanded population of people into the Medicaid program. Now, it serves primarily the youngest and the oldest Texans. Is that correct, sir? Good point. Yes, uh, the, the the people that are eligible for it are are among the youngest and the oldest, and the federal poverty levels that people qualify for vary to some degree. And so, 185 percent of federal poverty level is the group that that in the women and children, children up to about six years of age, that can participate in it. And then it drops down for children in six to 18, and then it fluctuates a little bit, and it's up around the 220 percent level for the elders that would qualify for nursing home care and things of that nature. So it's a, it's a variable uh, sort of qualification on, on uh, income level, federal poverty level, if you will. And a large percentage of those who are in nursing homes in Texas today, I believe, are uh, covered by Medicaid, is that correct? That's correct. If, About, if, they, uh, if they don't have the assets necessary. That's correct. Uh, I've heard the numbers between 70 and 80 percent of all of the nursing home patients are uh, Medicaid patients, uh, and that's, that, that's the only program that covers them for that. Uh, but obviously they, they can't have the wealth that would allow them to have private nursing yes, care that, qualify. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, the wealth uh, is something that, that would disqualify them. There was a time where, you know, there were uh, folks really kind of manipulating the system where they could uh, put some of their assets in different sorts of vehicles and stuff, and it wouldn't qualify for uh, an assets test, if you will. And so uh, people could get onto the Medicaid rolls for nursing home uh, support and still have substantial wealth out there that somebody could benefit from. I think they've largely worked that out for the most part. I don't think we find that as being quite as rampant as a situation as we've seen in the past. I'm not saying it doesn't occur to some extent that in every program there's fraud and abuse out there. We know that. Uh, but I think that particular one where people were able to uh, divest themselves of assets, and I put divest in quotes, they, um, I think they've sort of rooted that out for the sure. most part. Now, as part of the uh, expansion which, which for which Texas is eligible, under the Affordable Care Act. I've heard different numbers, but somewhere 90 to $100 billion over 10 years. And the Hospital Association has told us that uh, some 94% of that funding would come from uh, the federal government for those, for those first 10 years. Uh, do those numbers jive with what you? 
Yeah, th those are those are the numbers that I hear. Okay. Uh, I think most of us, uh, what you read is, I think, pretty pretty accurate. The, the first three years or so of the program, the federal government says they'll pay 100% of that cost. Now, that's not exactly true, okay? So don't, don't walk away from here say it, thinking that the federal government is, in fact, picking up all those costs. There are some costs that we incur uh, by, from the state's perspective related to the Affordable Care Act. Some of them are administrative costs, some of them are fee um, equity issues that have to be played out and so forth. So they're not all, it's not a free ride, and I, I use that in, in quotes also, you know, in terms of accepting that and getting 100% of that coverage there. But it is a substantial amount of coverage. And it's substantially more in terms of the share than we're receiving for the existing the chip and the existing Medicaid. Correct, correct. yeah, so the, good point. So as you recall, 4060 standard Medicaid, 3070 for chip. Uh, so now we get into a situation that says, okay, now we've got 100% covered by the federal government. Remember, your money and mine, you know, that's going up there anyway to help pay for this indigent health care program. And then after that, they sort of, as they sort of ratchet it down over the subsequent years so that it levels out at 90%. 10 cents of ours, 90 cents of the federal government. Uh, and that is in perpetuity, according to the Affordable Care Act, that it would in fact cover this expanded population of people in perpetuity um, at those that are up to 100, what is essentially 138% of the federal poverty level, childless adults is, is what it really uh, you know, comes down to and stuff. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's yet another uh, group of people in, in what I would call the, it is the entitlement program that, uh, that get a little bit different you know, shake out there than what we see in the rest of the program. And uh, uh, so uh, we would, I've heard numbers that say that uh, an additional one and one half million Texans roughly would be eligible if we were to accept those dollars. Is that generally correct? Yes, it, it is. It would uh, be a very substantial impact to the, the number of enrollees and to the program. And then for the financing of the uh, Federal Affordable Care Act, uh, some might say that they borrowed or stole, uh, I don't know what, the, six or seven hundred billion dollars from Medicare over a 10 year period by reducing payments to providers, essentially, is how the savings would be achieved to help keep the cost of the Affordable Care Act below a trillion dollars. Correct. Now, so it, would you, 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 you said you agree basically I, that's. I agree. Actually, Absolutely. Okay, so, and I'm not trying to make an argument, I'm just trying to make sure that people understand the lay of the land. But uh, even given all of that, the state is uh, pretty adamant in saying no. So wh why is it, in your opinion, that we should not take the bait? Uh, and, and I'm glad you phrased it that way, because that's, uh, that's certainly my, my perspective on it, that if we are going to uh, look at expanding this population under the current rules and restrictions that we have, then we are going to find ourselves as a state uh, and with a very, very burdensome uh, entitlement program that's going to continue to you know, drain revenue from other things that the state should be doing. In my opinion, the more important things that the state should be doing, which is education, infrastructure, water supplies, and things of that nature, real big mega issues, for which I think uh, we, we understand that there's a, a great deal of return on investment on those things. Um, but this, this program, and we've seen it in other states, will continue, even without expanding the current, to, to the current population, is going to continue to gobble up enormous amounts of, of money into, out of our system and compromise our ability to deliver on the rest of the program. And stuff. So, so I, I have a very serious concern about putting any more burden on the program than we have. Currently, 30% of Texas doctors are accepting new Medicaid patients. That has gone down substantially even since uh, uh, before the free settlement. Before the free settlement, which was uh, the, the settlement, as you may recall, it's kind of centered around dental care for children, but ultimately was settled by saying, well, okay, we're going to increase the amount of money we pay doctors and dentists, and there'll be more people participating, and access will be improved for these low income people. It worked, as a matter of fact, and we saw more people come into the system. We have seen over time, as you know, we've had some modest cuts in the budget. And kept them at zero percent at some times. We've seen that continually decline to the point now that you know one in three doctors will accept a Medicaid patient because the reimbursement rates are so low. Because directly related to the reimbursement rates and in, uh, in there, and I always 
call it, try to call it payment rates, okay. you know, as opposed to reimbursement. Right, right, it right. doesn't get paid. I don't know why I have to talk No, 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 it's, it's a very common vernacular, as a matter of fact, and, and, and I think that's been a psychological thing to say, oh, we're just paying the fees that are something. paying the doctors <laughs> under the Medicaid program. That's right, the fees are paid substantially lower than substantially the lower. Medicare. And you mentioned the Medicare program as uh, another area where we're seeing the potential for continued cuts on the providers back, not just the doctors, but the hospitals and everybody else out there. Um, we're going to see, I think, an ever-decreasing willingness of the providers out there, primarily the physician group, to willingness to take on patients in the not only the Medicaid program, but the Medicare program. That is a big chunk of people out there. Uh, going that, fast. That, and so, so here's the scenario in my mind. Say we go ahead and expand this population, and, doc, and they don't do anything about loosening up the reins that allow people to kind of get a more fair compensation for what they do, you know. And so, you know, all of a sudden we got people that, that aren't insured, they're <coughs> grossly underinsured. They're not uninsured, they're not insured, they are underinsured. And these people now have a sense that, hey, I've got insurance and therefore I'm entitled to go see you know, somebody. Car and go see the doctor. But I can't find the doctor that's gonna take me. Right. So where do you go? The emergency room. Exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to prevent. The most expensive portal to accessing healthcare is the emergency room. So now they end up in the emergency room. They're underinsured. They don't cover the cost of hospitalization. They don't cover the cost of being seen in an emergency room. And you know, and, and the physician group certainly isn't going to get paid you know any better than what they do. So we, we in a in a sense are going to do exactly what we saw happen in Massachusetts. That's what the same whole model after. That because we aren't addressing what are some of the significant infrastructure and provider issues out there. We're going to see this this group of people that suddenly become um, underinsured uh, feel like they have access to you know any type of portable care, and I think that it's going to really put us in a crunch in terms of being able to provide the care.